Today is November the 9th, 2005. I'm Clinton E. Morris. And we're here to make a camcorder documentary on a World War II veteran. His name is Hudson Downing, because I can't pronounce his middle name. Hudson, how do you say it? Uckhart. 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 Okay, that could, we, could, we could write a book on that one, but we'll move along. Hudson Uckhart Downing, and he lives at 5108 Somerville Road, Phoenix City, Alabama. 36867. That's our subject's home address and, and a little bit more about him before I leave him. Hudson was born in February 26, 1923. February 26, 1923. That means he's three years older than me, Mr. Hudson. And, uh, and now this is my name and address for the record, Clinton Errol Morris, 2290 Lee Road, 249, Smith's Station, Alabama, 36877. And the man who is sitting there behind the camera is a dear neighbor, and his name is Bill Van. And there's his name there. He lives right up the road at... 2120 Lee Road 249, Smith Station, Alabama, also. Uh, thank you for doing, the, doing it for us, Bill. My pleasure. Now, over here is Hudson. Good, good afternoon, Hudson. I have known uh, Hudson Downing since 1932 when I was in the first grade, and he was in the fourth grade uh, with my oldest brother. And they were both, and, 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 and this began... Uh, about five or six years ago, I was writing a book, and here's the book. I'm not trying to set it, they've all sold out anyway, and that's, that's the publisher prints some more. But I was writing about all of the veteran, World War II veterans from our little community of Smith Station. They were dying, and I'd go to the funerals and be very few people there who knew them. They didn't, and some of them didn't even know about World War II. And I said, I've got to tell about these heroes that I grew up with. So I went around here for a year or two trying to get everyone's name who served in World War II. And uh, I selected about a half a dozen, six or eight or ten uh, people there who were still living who could tell us about these things. And, and another person told me, said, well, go see Hudson Downing. I said, I haven't seen Hudson Downing in 50 years. He said, well, go see him. He is here. And I said, all I know, he was in aviation in World War II, and that's it. And so that, so I went to Hudson, and I wrote his story in that great book there, Five Cent Cotton and Ten Cent Meat. And, uh, and, and his story is really one of the highlights, is the highlight in the book. And so today we're getting this thing on tape. And so now we go and uh, Hudson, it was in uh, 1952. You had come up through the Great Depression and you had survived that in good shape and you had a good education and you were one of the best students in school, if not the best one. And uh, and, and you went to a business college, you got your degree from there, and then as you were about ready to make some life decisions and you were about to do this and that, all of a sudden you got a letter from one of your uncles. And his name was Sam. And his uncle Sam said, greetings. You mean you still have it? <laughs> his daddy took care of these records, he didn't do it. How about that? <laughs> From the order to report for inductions, the President of the United States to Hudson Newport Downing, order number 11-719, greetings. 
Okay, now that was a, of course Hudson and other known people who kept up the thing knew the war was coming. They knew we were going to get into it. There was no way out. But now Hudson, after you got that letter, can you tell us uh, where you went initially and how you got into aviation? Okay. <clears throat> It was in January of 1943. I got a greeting from the government to be inducted. I had already tried to get into the Air Force to be a cadet because I already had two years of college. I was 19 years old. They said, it's too late. You will have to be drafted and take basic training and then transfer into the Air Force if you can pass the original examination. That's just exactly what I did. I entered the Army in Anderson, Alabama. Then I was sent to Fort McPherson, Georgia, where I was classified. Graduating from a business college, I was to be a uh, clerk typist. I caught the troop train after five days and five nights and stopped in Pasadena, California. I, I was just a farm boy. <laughs> uh, it came up during the Depression. And uh, I, I've never been anywhere. So I got out there. I, I didn't know but one place. And that was the moon right up, straight up <laughs> over my head. So I took basic training out there, and after I finished basic training in Santa Anita, California, there was an article on the bulk board. If you have two years of college, please apply for pilot, navigator, or bombardier. So that's just exactly what I wanted to begin with. So, I went to my commanding officer. He says, too late. You are to go overseas shortly and join Patton that they go land in North Africa at Castle Blanco. And uh, I said, well, I know that. That's what the, the article says. But an article also said needed very badly because we were losing the war. We had no flies. So he gave in, let me go to Glendale, right down the street from the Rose Bowl. And I took a very rigid examination for three hours. It was 105 hours. And only 10 passed, and I was one of them. A few days later, I was in Salt Lake City, Utah, a place called Coons, taking take basic train all over again. But this time, cadet basic train, which is much tougher, much harder than the other. Then I finished the basic train there, and my next leg was to be sent to a, a CTD, which is a college training detachment. I went to Kansas State Teachers College in Emporia, Kansas, which was the home of William Allen White. There I took college courses in all math, weather, charts, everything for 16 weeks and had to pass. There was 105 of them, and I was number five. And when I went through that, one the past, one to that past, went on to San Antonio, Texas, to be classified, take a physical that lasted eight days, and one mental exam, to see well you qualify for pilot, navigator, or bombardier. And that's just exactly what I did. Very good. So you had a good, vigorous physical training, 
and then the academics, and you did well all the way through, and you and you had to study some more in jungle warfare and in intelligence gathering. From from reading your documents and all, uh, you had a lot to do with getting intel, intelligence, information from the enemies by some source. So you were involved in that clandestine part of aviation, I know. And, uh, and therefore, when you ship, when you got ready to leave to go to overseas, your parents didn't know what you were training for and no one else knew what you were training for and even Hudson Down and didn't know where he would be going. And pick it up right there. You're down in Miami, you've been do out in the jungle down there in the swamps, learning all this living style, the style of living down there, and now you're getting ready to go overseas and pick it up right there. We're going to back up just a little bit. Good. Something that's very important. In San Antonio, Texas, my scores were so high, I qualified to be a bomber, navigator, or a pilot. Mm -hmm. So they gave me my choice. My choice was a pilot. So I went to 16 weeks of what you call pre-flight training. Nothing but ground school. Code, boss code. Uh, aircraft engines. Meteorology. They stress meteorology. Then, that was six weeks. Won the past, went on to primary, which was Chickasha, Oklahoma. In Chickasha, Oklahoma, I learned to fly PT-19s and learn acrobatics, go ground school through one hour every day, had a wonderful instructor. Now, there still was 105 of us. And I, out of the 105, I was the first one to solo. Even though some of the cadets were already pilots, they were young, and had engineering training, which I didn't, I was still the first one to solo. And when you solo, they give you solo wings. Well, I have them on my cap right here. <laughs> yeah. I still have them. And then after you finish there, you have to have instrument training. You send you to basic training. I went to Kansas. Then after you finish there, you go to other schools. You see, the reason I'm staying in the West because I was in the Western Command in Lincoln, Nebraska. Well, what I didn't know was going on, and nobody else, that Roosevelt and General Ishimo Chiang Kai-shek were very close friends. Now, Chiang Kai-shek was head of the Nationalists in China. He was the one and had the flying tigers. There never was but seven, seven to six of flying tigers, and they had 98 P 40 fighters. All of Asia uh, uh, had fallen to the Japanese. The Japanese had really been at war with China for four or five years, mm -hmm. and they, could take, they had taken everything except one place, and that, that was uh, Kunming, China. So the Flying Tigers kept them out. General Chenault, he was retired, he was a retired fighter pilot. Uh, he was called up as, as a general. He had married General Ishimo Shane Kashyyyk's daughter. Okay. The Flying Tigers were civilians. They were paid $500 a month, which was a lot of money, and $50 for every plane they shot down. <laughs> okay. 
Well, his tactics, the fighter pilots, is the best that the other was. He believed when he got notice from the radar where they were coming to put his fighters in the air and let the sun be to the back. So when the Japanese came in, they didn't know where they came from. It just so happened that the Japanese had their best pilots in the southern part of Burma, and we were in the northern part of Burma. And when we broke up, or the Flying Tiger broke up, the formation of the Zeros from the bombers, they were just targets. Some of the Flying Tigers became aces in one trip. An ace is when you shoot down five uh, uh, different uh, five aircraft. And uh, we never did lose but six Flying Tigers. Then, when war was declared, after uh, Japan jumped on Pearl Harbor, uh, by the way, it's, very, it's, un, it's misunderstood. The Japanese had six aircraft carriers, not four. And, and uh, so the Flying Tigers were drafted into the Army. Now, I never didn't know what I was trained for because before I went overseas, and I, after I had finished my flying, I had a high IQ. They took the ones with a high IQ and wanted us to volunteer for something, uh, which I did. Well, I went to the University of California for jungle training. Nothing but jungle training, how to survive in the jungle, First aid courses, everything, for two months. Had to pass, pass that. Well, still top secret, top secret. We couldn't even talk to any, anybody about it. Finished there, they said, well, you got to go to the University of Miami for about a couple So then we were completely, you know, what we were going to do. So I went to the University of Miami. Uh, uh, by the way, the Army had taken over Miami Beach, had taken all the hotels and all. It was full of soldiers getting ready to go overseas. I went to school at the University of Miami with top honors, more advanced general training. And a rumor had broken out that we were going to guard the Suez Canal and have it easy during the war. How little did I know. So, one night on the fourth floor at 11 o'clock, an MP with an officer came in, called out five names. Now, I had had 17 months of training, highly trained. The five names they called out, one of them was mine. So with a MP with a machine gun, said, let's go to the chapel. I went to the chapel and they, they did everything with barriers. So after that, with the MP. They put us in a GI truck and took us to 36th Street Airport, right out from Carl Gables, which is in Miami. There, a C-54, the largest transport we have, was ready for just five. And it would hold 45. And we couldn't understand it. We were handed our orders says, do not open your orders until one hour out. So we were completely confused. And uh, what was really confusing was, that's a big cargo plane, 
four engines, which we use across the ocean, fire passions, which was, I was one of them. Well, an hour out, I opened up. My order said, Calcutta, India. Now, <laughs> I went through all the training to be a fighter pilot. I studied the Messerschmitt. I studied all the other fighters. We didn't have a good fighter at that time. And, 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 and uh, uh, having that knowledge and going to Calcutta, India, we just didn't know what to expect. Well, I've never been asked sick before in my life. Well, I got asked sick when I read Calcutta, India, other side of the world. So anyway, we were landed at the Bermuda Islands, which was the first leg going to Calcutta, India, my destination. So you stopped in Bermuda on the first step to refuel, of course. Right. And then you progressed from one area to another till you got to uh, Cal Cal Cutter. No. No, to uh, Karachi. Right. That's where you eventually landed. Right. We, from the Bermuda Islands, mm -hmm. which was a 12 hour hop over the Atlantic, mm -hmm. if the plane went down, you only lived 40 seconds if you survived, the so called. With the Azor Islands off the coast of Casablanca. Well, Casablanca had just fallen to Patton. And we had just sunk the French fleet across the Mediterranean. It had fallen into the hands of the Germans, and they were going to use it against us. We knew that. So it was mostly British went in and sunk the French fleet. Well, the Gaulle got mad. They actually fired on us. Well, I could understand why, and then I, I had my doubts. Well, the next leg from Casablanca was Algeria, Tunisia, and, and then to uh, Tel Aviv, then to Baghdad, then to Aberdeen, Iran, then to Karachi, India, which was the biggest base we had in the East. It was huge. It belonged to the Dutch. We had leased it from the Dutch. So after I got there, they said, we can use two or three of you. There's more coming. They took your training. Well, what I could see was okay. I'd say, well, I volunteered to stay, and that's where my base was. Karachi, uh, Pakistan, which was a province of India. India at that time was owned by the British. India owned uh, in, uh, India, they owned Burma, they owned Nepal, and uh, but we had to uh, more or less take orders from the British command, which was Count Mike, Mike Batten. Mike, Count Mike, Mike Batten. And uh, he was head of the Asiatic command. But we still had to honor the religions of the countries that we went to. So now you've finished your basic training you made this trip across the halfway around the world, thinking you may be going to Panama or some other place, and now you've landed there and you discovered that you've already given us a little brief situation at that time when Pearl Harbor was hit. They had been fighting the Chinese for four or five years, and they had just about wiped Chiang Kai-shek's army off the face of the earth. They were backed up there next to the Himalayas and the Japanese had cut off all of the outside world to them and they couldn't get supplies to them and there they were dying 
and Roosevelt said, hey, we got to save that Jap that Chinese army. We got to save it so they can fight those Japanese with us. They'll occupy a lot of troops. So Roosevelt created that head of war over there. It's called what? CBI theater. The CBI. I, I China, Burma, India. The China, Burma, India theater of war. And the people have, have forgotten that if they ever knew it. That was a very important theater of war. And that's where he found himself when this country boy landed over there about age 20 by then almost, weren't you? Right. And he was, so he found himself there and they had to get supplies over the Himalayas. And Hudson, up here on the wall, I got a little story here about the Himalayas. You can look at it from right here. You had to get those supplies from over there to over here to save that Chinese army or they were gone. And you were gonna fly in an airplane, this is a C-46 I believe, C-47 and C-46s were supposed to fly over the Himalayas to take those supplies. And some of those supplies were? Mostly gasoline, ammunition, food, uh, anything else so we could keep the flying tigers flying. We had to hold Hud Bing in order to get on our return trips, after we took the supplies over the hump, we were brought back Chinese soldiers to help train a Chinese army. You see, in India, we only had a skeleton force of Americans, British, uh, Australians, and Scots. We were outnumbered by 10 to 1 because Burma had fallen to the Japanese. And we built a little airfield all up and down the Burma-China uh, line. So as we flew those Himalayas, the, the, the C-47 and the C-46 were built only to fly 12,000 feet. So at times, to escape the fighters at Mishinor, which was the biggest fighter base the Japanese had. It was in the north. We fly as high as we could. We put boosters on the engines. That means your propeller would turn faster. And we would, we would have to en enrich the mixture to get up that high. Well, a lot of mistakes were made at first. And because of those mistakes, there's a thousand planes over right now unaccounted for. I'd like to go through those mistakes, the two or three major ones. One of them was over the hump. From Chabot to Kundi was only 700 miles. That was three hours and 58 minutes when the air was calm. Okay. They only gave us 20 minutes extra of gas to make the trip. They forgot to figure out headwinds, storms, and everything else. Over the Himalayas, they never had been flown before. Nobody. You got Mount Everest there. Nobody ever flew over Mount Everest. <laughs> we flew around it. And uh, uh, the, 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 the tires on the cargo, on the cargo planes, the steel belted nylon tires, very strong, because your runways were built out of this engineering mesh, and and uh, you have those monsoon rains over there. It keeps that mesh wet all the time, and when you come in to land, if you're not very careful, your tailspin tear the plane up. So they forgot about the tailwheel. The tail wheel had cotton cord. So we'd come in to land and drop the tail wheel, say 100 miles an hour. Sometimes it'd blow out. 
and, 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 and but, but the plane had to be flown. So what did we do? We put rope, hemp, or vines, or anything around the rim of the tail wheel. <laughs> that would last about one trip, but we had to do it again until our tail wheel came back from the States with nylon cords. So you're, you're flying these planes over the Himalayas in the toughest flying in the world. Now, I know I, I put two years on a C-47 myself as a plane captain, just flying cargo back and forth uh, in the States. And so I know a little bit about them. And you hit a cloud, and, and, and there's not much control. But the toughest flying in the world, I had to do a little bit of research in doing Hudson's story. And sometimes they'll have a tailwind of 100 miles an hour. Is that right? That's right. And you'd have downdrafts and updrafts. I know any time we flew, flew out around the Rocky Mountains, it got rough around the mountains, but over there were the tallest mountains in the world and and those planes would start icing up when they got above 12,000, 20,000, they start icing up. That means, can you, that means when they icing up, the ailerons won't function and you lose control of the plane and you're just like, like a rock up there. Now they have, uh, have things to get the ice off the windshield and they have de-ices out here on the, uh, on the wings to sort of uh, a tube that put, put liquid in and, and it breaks the ice off the edge of the wings and things. But, but that was the most dangerous flying in the whole world. And they lost so many planes going over the hump here. So many. Hudson was telling me that uh, he, he asked a question, well, what if we get lost in the jungle and there's no contact and we get turned around in the clouds and the storms and even when we can see our way out how do we know where to go and he told you to follow some kind of a trail if the weather was clear which very seldom we lost so many planes we could have had an, an aluminum trail of fallen planes that we followed <laughs> just look down and follow the wrecked planes where these people lost I was trying to navigate through the through and around the mountain. Now he mentioned a few minutes ago de-isis. De-isis is heat coming from the engines that go into the wings so that the aerons on your wings would function. They had to be kept open all the time if they, ah, if they froze up, you had no control of, of the airplane. You see, at times we were 26,000 feet. Now we were trained over and over again what to do in case of emergencies. And that was one of them if we de-iced up. Dump the cargo. The cargo planes had no doors. And we put the gasoline on tracks. And if, if we had engine trouble because the boosters were burning the engines up, we'd, we'd go back there right quick, 40, 40 degrees below zero, cut the ropes, and the gasoline would just roll out the door, mm -hmm. and we'd save the personnel and the plane if we could. Okay, so as you uh, came across the Himalayas, you got to your target, you had to come down fast for that little runway you were on. And uh, I said, I read that you had to chew gum and swallow and so forth to keep your ears from popping. And so that was a very dangerous mission. And, uh, and I have to admire someone who took part in it. And so we'll be back with the next chapter when we change the tape. You're doing a superb job. Yeah. We'll come back to that scene there when you return.
You got a little darker, but you're going to fill out while we're out here today. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's take the letter in the middle first. What's that about? In 1944, Shane Kushek gave me a medal. And I didn't receive the medal until 1981. The aura for the medal was lost. And uh, I got a call from the War Department. I was a stockbroker. And one of my secretaries said, you've got a call from the War Department. <laughs> well, my brother-in-law was in the War Department. He was a general. And my sister was sick, and I thought that's what it was. And they said, uh, your name is Downing. I said, yes, sir. They said, could you help us out? I said, what do you, what do you need to know? He said, we are looking for a Hudson Downing. We have a medal here. It belongs to him, and our records show he's missing in action. <laughs> well, my jaw dropped to here. <laughs> I said, what is his army serial number? They gave it to me, and it was mine. <laughs> I said, you are talking to him. He said, I can't believe it. I said, you are. I says, I never wasn't listening in action but six weeks. And uh, that's, that's where the and message so is. So this medal here then, is that medal from Shang Kai Shek. Right. It's, a, it's, a, it's awarded by the Chinese. Right. And what is that attractive? That's the... That, that, that is the China India Bummer. Emblem. The C B I Emblem. Emblem. Right. And who is this handsome young man here? <laughs> I was in flying school in Chickasha, Oklahoma. Oh, I was 19 years old. Okay. <laughs> and you now I'm going to uh, hand me that big the big thing there. Yeah, that one. I want to use that at this particular moment. I'll let you tell us about it later, but I want to use it here. Okay, Mr. Bill Van, now I'm going to use my pointer here, my official pointer. Now this is a little flag that the pilots, like our friend Hudson Downing over here, if they were crashed up in the jungles where the Japanese controlled, they would attach, they had, uh, would attach this to their back. And that says, if you, uh, this is a, this is a ally person fighting the Japanese. If you find him, uh, feed him and bring him to the nearest military base and you will be well rewarded. Correct. Something to that effect. Correct. And then Hudson explains to me though, when the Japanese saw that thing, they'd use it as a target to shoot you with. So sometimes he said they would take it off their back and put it in their pocket. <laughs> but anyway, that was, yeah, that was what this was all about. Now Hudson, this right here looks like just a regular Air Force emblem here. Handmade, right. Handmade. And this is your uh, CBI again. Handmade. And this is, I know that's the presidential citation. Presidential citation with action star in the middle of it. So that was in the CBI theater. That's a battle star. The battle star. Now down here, this is your wings. Right. And down here, it's very interesting. You have H.U. Downing in English. And then you have it in Arabic. And then you have it in Chinese, I guess. Very good. And that was what you... Uh, one of the jungles and all. Now, just by passing by Hudson, you you really picked this up in uh, Okinawa. Iwo, G uh, Iwo Jima. I Iwo, that was picked up in, in Iwo Jima. Okay. And that is... Because a, after I finished with CBI, they lost my records and sent me to the Pacific. And that is 
And if my Japanese wife, Atsuko Emasaki, were here right now, she would come out and demonstrate this for us. But she's not here right at the moment. So now we'll go to the next topic. Okay. Let's go to another. Let's go to uh, we'll go this guy right here. It, yeah. I'm going to make sure we know that it was uh, all here on the paper, too. Let me know when you're ready here. Now, when Hudson was there, he was sent into the jungles to rescue downed pilots. And he had made many contacts in the jungles with the, with the natives. And this gentleman here in this newspaper article, and here's the real picture. This picture uh, of him, and uh, I, I don't recall his name at the moment. His name was Fossil Dozzle. Fossil Dozzle. How can you miss a name like Fossil Dozzle? And so he was a headhunter. Now, sometimes headhunters would hunt other headhunters. They were the enemies. And you have a, uh, a little thing over there that, no, the, the, the hair. The uh, a headhunter would catch another headhunter and separate him from the top part of his anatomy. And we have it <laughs> placed right here. I'm sorry, here it is. I, I have it. So tell us about this. This, this is a skip. <laughs> Uh, I had a lot of trouble getting this to the country, back in the country. And is, this, this was what Faisal Dazzle, the chief of the Cochin headhunters, that we paid constantly all the time to help us get some of our fly back. Well, to honor me, he gave me a scout. <laughs> now, the reason he gave me this scalp was, this scalp came from a man who will be my servant after I'm dead and gone for the rest of my life. <laughs> so that was the highest honor he could give me. So the government sprayed it and sprayed it and then did it on the inside and I brought it home. <laughs> it's, so Mr. It's, Fossil Dazzle made that contribution. Right. Why are you standing there, Hudson? Uh, look over here, Bill, if you can. Now they had, they carried things in these C-47s and 6s over there. From they, they'd load them down with dynamite and fuels, and they also took jeeps and motors, and, and but they also took, uh, now here's a elephant, he's loading a 55 drum of something there, Hudson. He, he is helping us load a 55 drum of gas on the plane <laughs> to put it on the track so we can get it in it's so heavy and it says in the writing here that it's as much work as 20 men right. or something that one right. elephant does right and what in the world is this mule okay. doing okay, here? Right here we need beast of burden real bad we had none they worship cows over there so uh, they were gods so we managed to get some mules for the Mara Marauders. So they need them, we had to take them over the hump. And this picture right here shows us loading two mules on a C-46. <laughs> they had a vet with them, and it would put a muzzle on them sure. to give them oxygen and a shot uh -huh. until we got them over there. And this is a very rare picture. It is very, very important. A lot of mules were used in the war. That's Both right, we yeah. had to. Both in years and over. Now, over here is another one of these, what we just showed you. This is a flag that goes on the flyer telling them to, if you pick up this person, he's a friend, The Japan, he's an enemy of the Japanese, feed him and bring him to us and we'll reward you. Now, when, the, when you rewarded them, uh, there were some things that they didn't have that they really wanted, and so you negotiated with them with what? Okay. Now, they always wanted to be paid. They're Stone Age people, the headhunters. And there's two main tribes, a lot of tribes, but two main ones we dealt with were the Cochins, spelled it with a K, and 
the Cochin, you spell it with a C. And they, they were rivals, and they'd hunt one another and, and, and uh, cut the heads off and take them back to the base and eat them. Well, this <laughs> picture right here, this one right here, supposed to have been my supper. <laughs> and, and he was highly, uh, uh, he, well, he didn't like it because I, <laughs> I brought my own food and water. I, I had to go into that camp 10 days. We had to make enemy. I mean, we had to make uh, contact with them and friends, but we had to use a hunting trail to bomb. It was so thick with a machete, you couldn't go to City Rock all day long. And then the, the heat, 120 degrees, would be raining. So we had to use a head on. And what that award was at the begin with, we gave them machetes. Here's one right here. Brought one home with them. They wanted machetes, and we made a mistake by sending them over there with cowhide on them. We had to send them back. Oh, so, we, so we went down here in Colombia, in South America, had these made by the plane loads. Now, those are made from what? Goat skin. Goat skin. Goat skin. But not cow skin. No. So they worship cow, the cows. Cow, that's right. Our flying jackets were cowhide. Yeah. We had to send all of them back. And had them remade out of goat skin, and and and, and our boots was made out of buffalo hide because shoes were made out of cow hide. We, we couldn't use them, so we had to use buffalo snake boots. While we're looking at these, won't you explain to us what this is? Now, what he just shows you is uh, what he just shows samurai sword. Is is a samurai sword? The blade on this is sacred. It's a thousand years older than handles, and uh, it's made out of Damascus steel, and uh, it's it's very very valuable. And the Japanese families are trying to get these back because they're holy, and some of them will pay most of the price you want. Now here's a small one right here, same thing, except it's just small. One. Now. You have heard and read about the Japanese committing Harry Carey. Mm -hmm. That's taking their own life. Sometimes, when they did, they would use a small samurai, uh, this knife, right here. It's made out of rosewood. It's carved roses all on the front. Here. That's what it looks like. Beautiful. That's beautiful. There's, there's no telling what it's worth. No telling. I've had all this stuff. I brought it home with me uh, when I got discharged in 1946. Now, I know I finally convinced you to show some of these awards you received for benefit of educating the public in the future. Not many of us old time is left. So that's some. Why don't you tell us about these medals, starting with that one. This is your air medal. Lots of them got them. If you did something beyond the call of duty, and you had witnesses, they would award you with an air medal. Now, this air medal right here stands out more than any other. Because when I had made a trip to Calcutta, and I had done something to get it. They had a band waiting on me to give me the medal and the other members of the crew. You know what the band consisted of? A tuba and a banjo and a flute and something else. So you can imagine the kind of music that, that I heard when I was uh, presenting this. Yes. And now, that might drop off. This, this is about the highest honor you can get as a flyer. This is the Distinguished Flying Cross, right here. Now, would you like to tell me? Mm -hmm. to, would you like for me to tell about this one? Yes, absolutely. Okay. I was flying to hunt. We had all of our instructions. The weather was supposed to be clear. And we were trained. If we spotted a zero, as high as we were, 
26,000 feet. We could go any higher. To find a cloud and go into the cloud for 10 minutes, round and round. Because we knew the Japanese, if he got that high, he couldn't last for seven minutes. And we had to preserve all the gas we could. Well, we came out of the cloud, and the navigator said, Alabama, look underneath. <laughs> I looked, there's no mountains. We